huge list of things that are barriers to God's presence in our life, God's um, domain in our in our world and in our country and in our individual lives. All of these things. We have, how many have ever been disobedient to a parent? You don't have to raise your hand. Because most of us have, at some point in time, said no, and not just no, but no, to a parent. We have gone against what their teachings are. As a parent, how many of you have ever experienced that with a child? Again, you don't have to raise your hand. We've all experienced that, in which we have been disobedient. And it is an aspect of ruin inside of a, uh, a family, inside of a church, without the gracious presence of God. As a father of four kids, there have been many times in which the gracious response that God would have preferred was outweighed by a barrier of Bill's humanness. And as a result of that, grace was not dispensed to a child who needed to see that, to feel it, to experience it. So the barriers of God's grace are things that we want to take a look at and examine in our life and then turn those things around as he's going to uh, kind of lead us towards in a little bit. Paul's going to have us understand some things about how we can change the direction of grace, both from God as well as out to others. I'm going to have us skip down to verse 10. But you followed my teaching, conduct, and we've been looking at Paul's life, which means we've been looking at his conduct for the last several months. Incredibly powerful presence that Paul had. But you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will be easily will be softly lived will have an easy life will have a comforter at every turn <laughs> will be persecuted this is an aspect of the Christian life that we oftentimes overlook that Paul understands that anybody who calls Jesus Christ as Savior will be persecuted we might not have experienced this yet to some degree, we probably have for family members or friends or something like that. But this is going to get more intense. It will get more and more intense in our life. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man and woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Grace. There are some really large, um, momentous uh, kinds of, uh, of, of expressions of God's grace. Communion is one of those. Baptism is another one, and I am always honored when I have uh, the privilege and the honor to be a part of someone's decision to publicly go out and go through baptism. And the other one is marriage. Those three are, is, are those moments in which God's, a godly kind of existence, in which God's grace is put on display. God's grace is put on display whenever I come across somebody who's been married for a long period of time beyond a day, beyond a year, beyond 10 years, in which God's grace has seen them through. I've shared with you many times that it is God's grace that saw us through a really huge, difficult, ugly time in our life. And God brought people into our life to dispense grace. God allowed us to get through a real difficult three or four years when we first moved here. But it is that kind of endurance that he's talking about that is God's grace on display. But there are also some other things that we're going to look at, not just in here, uh, but also in a few other passages in which we're going to look at how Paul has encourages us to live out being a grace dispenser and really experience the grace of God. A few of these are kind of listed in what we just read, but also they're going to be in previous chapters as well as a couple of other segments of, of, uh, of Scripture. Patience. How many of you quit praying for patience? 
I did. <laughs> because if you pray for patience, God will train you up. I guarantee you He will. Purpose, discovering the purpose. We can't find that without a close relationship with God. Love, persecution, all of it's captured in the one word that we found in this particular passage, that is conduct. How do we conduct our lives? How do we conduct our relationship with Jesus? How do we purposely pursue God's gracious presence in our life? It's easy when we come here, when we have worship teams like what we were blessed by today that lead us in worship and allow us just to experience God's presence. It becomes a lot harder when we walk out there to purposely pursue God's gracious presence because we will get busy. Once we leave this building, the busyness of life, and I'm going to say it again, the myth of being too busy for God begins to press in on us. So Paul's conduct, he says in the, in the passages of 10 on about his endurance, that we do need to be somebody who prays for endurance and that we endure suffering and persecution. Remember, over the, over the last several months, we've talked about the times in which Paul was stoned and dragged out of the city and left for dead. Did Paul ever get up and just say, I'm going to throw a stone right back at him? I'm going to get up once I'm, 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 I'm aware and awake and, and fairly conscious. I'm going to grab a stone. I'm going to chuck it at somebody who was part of that group that was stoning me. No, he didn't. Grace is what Paul did by. Riots of huge gatherings of thousands of people that were focused both verbally as well as physically against Paul because he spoke about Jesus Christ in prison. He was beaten, not just that one time, but multiple times for speaking about Jesus Christ. He was shipwrecked. He was snake bit. And finally, if all of that wasn't enough, he was a prisoner under the Emperor Nero, who was burning Christians, who was wrapping them, Christians, in uh, animal skins and throwing them to hungry dogs, who would wrap them in leather and dunk them into, uh, into water and then put them into hot sun to slowly suffocate. Nero was an intense adolescent because he came into power when he was 16. So Paul is underneath all of this stuff. Paul is continuing to write to Timothy to say, hey, understand that this stuff is going to go on in your lifetime and also in 2016 and beyond. We must be ready for that. So here's a few things that I'm going to ask us to uh, contemplate about our uh, uh, reci being a recipient of God's precious grace, but also being a dispenser of somebody who has grace in them that allows somebody else to feel it. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of the first things that I think about. Everybody in here has probably been wronged by somebody. Somebody ha has wronged you to some extent, whether it's through work, school, at church, other places that you've been wronged, okay? You know that there's even a science right now that's studying the power of forgiveness, looking at what happens to the emotional state as well as uh, recording uh, images of their brain that once somebody truly forgives, and it is an act of willpower, please understand that. It takes a while for when we forgive for that act to move down into here and meld with our heart. But it is a command from our God to forgive. To forgive. Matthew 18, 21 through 22 says this. Peter approaches Jesus and asks, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how, mu how often must I forgive him? And I'd love to think about Peter thinking, is it like seven times? Because that's a lot, isn't it? It would be for many of us. Like, I'm, so I'm going to throw out a number for Jesus to approve. Like seven times? And Jesus says, no. I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. 77 times. That we're to forgive. In other words, the message is you're to forgive, and you're to forgive, and you're to forgive. What a hard thing it is. I want you to just take a moment, think about somebody that you need to forgive. How many? 490 times. I think Jennifer's on 583 now with me. So think about somebody that you're holding on to the poison that is called unforgiveness. Because they don't have a clue. But once we forgive, we're released from all that. Once we experience that. And again, it is an aspect of graciousness. It is an aspect of grace dispensing to somebody else. Ephesians 4.32, Paul tells the church in Ephesus, Be kind to one another, 
compassion, forgiving one another as God has forgiven you in Christ. And in Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with one another, forgiving one another. If one has a grievance against another as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must do as well. Forgiveness is not easy. Gandhi has a great quote. The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. Forgiveness is a powerful and difficult thing to do. And this is the other thing. I think it's important to remember this. That once you forgive, it doesn't mean you forgot. Forgiveness doesn't equate to forgetting. We, we must learn from things that have gone on in our past. But forgiveness is an act of will. I've got a couple of stories here that I'm just going to share with you real quick. The first one is a young lady named Christy Little Jones uh, from Maryland. She's 42. Married for 10 years to her husband. 10 years, and they have four children, including a stepson. She received an email one day, and it said this. You don't know me, but I am no longer dating your husband. I'm sorry for any pain I may have caused your family. Up until that point, Christie's life, 10 years married to this man, was a relationship that she believed was on par, was good, was they were active in the church. They were doing things that demonstrated that God was active in their life. But this email woke her up to the reality of something going wrong in their marriage. And it was staggering, she said. But she said this, once the initial shock passed, and this took many months, I was faced with a choice. I could either fight for my marriage or let this event change everything and hurt more people. I needed to represent Christ to my children and to the world. Christy made a conscious decision to forgive. But forgiveness is one aspect, and it said that the forgiveness didn't feel, okay, feel instantaneous. It took months where she struggled with resentment and fear. Fear if she was doing the right thing. Fear if she was doing, it wasn't the comfortable thing. It wasn't the easy thing. It was the courageous thing to do in their life together. She says they still struggle with trust issues. Anybody that's ever had some kind of infidelity in their life in which one or the other partner has struggled with flirtatious, and please be careful with flirtatious movements, because the enemy can make them stronger and stronger and stronger until you find yourself in the midst of something that is hard to get out of. But she says this, we continue to work on our trust issues, but I forgave my husband, and our marriage is stronger for it. I have no regrets. That husband experienced grace from a strong woman who was willing to humble herself and willfully say, I forgive you. And it slowly and, and, and but consistently, the head decision melded with the heart and healed this marriage. It had no regrets. This one I read, it was pretty powerful. For seven re years, this mother dreamed of revenge. Seven years after her son was murdered, his throat slit from ear to ear at the killer's hand. Samira al -Najad, fought the demons of hatred, revenge, and poison against her son's killer. On April 15, 2014, Al-Najad walked slowly toward the gallows with where the killer was at, where his family was among the crowd of onlookers. And a blindfolded Jaseri, weeping, begged one last time for her forgiveness. Al-Najad moved in close, face to face, with her son's killer. All this hatred that she had, all this anger, all this revenge that she had thought about for seven years. And she said, face to face, nose to nose with her son's killer, did you have mercy on us? Did you show mercy to my son? You have taken happiness away from us. Why should I have mercy towards you now? al stared angrily at him. Then she slapped him across the face. Then she and her husband slipped the noose off his neck. And with that move, her son's killer, death sentence, had been commuted. She had the power to say, kill him now, or let me take the noose off of his neck. And she chose to have forgiveness at that moment. 
Alnajad said she feels relief. She felt an incredible relief that moment. This slap made me feel all of the blood that accumulated in my heart over the years suddenly that burst out and poured away and emptied my heart of it. I felt peaceful, and I do not think about revenge anymore. The powerful aspect of forgiveness communicates grace to a world that never knows it, may, may not experience it. We need to give grace to our brothers and sisters in many different ways. I read another article about a pastor, Eric Fitzgerald, whose wife, June, who was seven months pregnant, was killed by a drunk driver. Seven months pregnant with their son. Matt, who was 24, or was 20 years old at the time that this happened, went to prison. After some time of grieving and, and praying together with many members of his church family, he was struck by a comment from one of their youth members. One of the youngsters came alongside him, and after they'd been praying and kind of comforting this guy, this pastor, Eric Fitzgerald, this young person said this, I wonder how he's doing. Which absolutely floored the pastor. And it also began at that moment a six-year relationship between Eric and his wife and sons. Killer. They prayed. He forgave him. They fellowshiped. They talked. They read scripture together. And it was the healing power of forgiveness that dispensed grace to this young man who needed something fierce. And this is what's incredible about this story. This young man and his now wife, when they have one child, they're expecting a second, second one, worship in the church that Gary pastors. That is grace that everybody can feel and experience. And that is the act of a loving community. An, an, an area in which we struggle with because it takes strength to forgive someone like that. Like any kind of wrongdoing that has happened in our life. This young man could have gotten hardened in prison, could have took, taken a completely different road, but because this pastor realized that he was forgiven and he needed to forgive this young man, grace was dispensed out. And a young man and his now his wife and his children are Christians, are believers, and are also dispensing grace. You think this young man is going to be a grace dispenser? I guarantee that he is. Because he's been forgiven, not only by this guy, but by Christ. So we got forgiveness as one of the main components of being a grace dispenser to others. Second one is prayer. We need prayer for our strength. We need prayer for healing. We need prayer for guidance, courage, discernment. One of the things that Paul talks about, we're going to look at it again next week, and that is the reason we need to be aware of the Word and, and in the Word and discerning of the Word is because the enemy will dress up people in sheep's clothing and come into the church. you got to remember that. It's so why we use this, why we read it, why we need to bathe ourselves in it so that we can discern false teaching. And I've told you this many times. If you ever sense that I am not in this, I'm not preaching from this, you need to call me up. Go up to Buzz and say, hey, we need to talk to Bill. I need it. I need the accountability from you all. And again, I've said this before. If this is the only time between 10 o'clock-ish and 11 o'clock-ish that you look at this, we as Christians are in trouble. This is where we need to gain our strength from. The Holy Spirit is fed by God's Word so that we can live stronger, we can live more courageously, and we can live more peacefully around others, to be kind to one another. So prayer. Paul's life was bathed in prayer, constantly in prayer. I love that when Kathy, before we ever began, before you ever walked in here, there was fun technology things going on, you know, screeching instruments and things like that, and just kind of struggling through some things, and, and uh, Kathy just kind of just quickly said, Father, uh, we just pray that you would help us with all this music stuff and technology and all of that, in Jesus' name. This went out. <laughs> Absolutely. Things went on fine. Prayer is critically important that we spend the time one on our own, but also with our brothers and our sisters, locking arms to pray. That's why I give you names of people every Sunday. My hope and my prayer is that you don't just forget about them when you leave this building, but that you continue to lift up the names of people that we share that we need to be praying about. It is what we're called to do. 
because we know that God hears us. First John 5 says, says this to us. This is the confidence which we have. That if we ask anything according to His will, and this is sometimes the piece that we often miss, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which, which we have asked from Him. Individually, corporately, with brothers and sisters, we are to ask for God's will to be done in our life. For God's strengthening hand to be on us, which will include suffering, which will include inconvenience, will include the need for us to forgive someone. And the enemy will love to make it harder and harder. In 1963, when the Supreme Court ruled that, it was, that prayer was unconstitutional in schools and subsequently in public buildings, government buildings. You just want to track some things that took place in our country from that moment forward. Which I think is kind of funny. Madeline O'Hare, if you've ever read about her, she was an atheist and came up against this because she didn't think it was right for prayer to be in schools. So she put this out there and fought it hard and, and, and because of her push as an atheist, prayer was out there. You know what, the, uh, this is not the funny part, but her, her and one of her sons went missing. And they were discovered dead and buried in a, in a desert in, uh, in Southern California. The funny part about all this is this, that her other son is an incredibly evangelical preacher. Raised in the same home where an atheist was at. God can do anything once somebody wants to taste, once somebody wants to see, once somebody wants to reach out and experience the incredible presence of God. Prayer is critically important. And finally, the last one, which is the last two or three verses in this passage of chapter 3. And it's about God's Word. It says this, All Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God and the, man of, and, and the woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Searching Scripture. Spending time in His Word in which we truly study, but also just let it bathe us. Let it wash over us. And asking the Holy Spirit to reveal something new and different this time. When we do that, we are actually allowing God's inspired Word to feed us so that we gain nutrition. There's always this whole thing, discussion about church as it isn't relevant to me today. Church seems to be irrelevant to me. The Bible is irrelevant. God is irrelevant. All those kind of discussions that keep people from attending church or going away from church. When I looked up relevance, it said this, logically connected with and important, and important to the matter at hand. I guarantee you God is important to the matter at hand in this world today. And so is His Word. Is it appropriate? Grace, when, when God's Word is handled accurately, which is second in, in the second chapter of, of Second Timothy. When God's word is handled accurately, there is a melding of the mind, knowing the word, with living the word. Separate, these two can, can go against each other and can create a bad picture of who God is. I know a lot of people who can Bible thump and Bible thump and Bible thump and Bible thump, but they don't love well. And they chase people away. I know people who just get led by some experiential things. They never have them grounded in the Word of God. Both of those can lead you away from the truth of God and being a real grace dispenser. Grace dispensing requires us to be close to the Word of God. I mentioned barbecuing earlier. Earlier, Is food relevant to you? Is food relevant to you? If it is, we can get by on cheese and crackers. Couldn't we? That's all we need. We just need a little nutrition once in a while. But how many of you just love to dig into a good happy burger? Probably just me. How many of you just want a nice steak dinner once in a while? Or ribs? Or something healthier? Salads and things like that. We have a taste bud. We have said it on our tongue. So many taste buds that God has blessed us with so we can experience food. It's the same thing with God's Word. Do we taste it? Do we take the time to let it wash over us so that we can savor what it is and what He's speaking to us about? If people don't believe that the Bible is relevant today or that God is relevant today, it's because they haven't tried it. 
it's because we haven't given it an opportunity to show itself, to overwhelm us with how much joy and love there is in who he is and his word to us. It's also because we've ignored it. Ever come across a piece of uh, scripture, a passage of scripture, or a preacher that speaks something to you and is directly out of the word of God? You go, oh, I wonder if you can't really mean that. You really can't mean that I have to do such and such. You really, that can't be it. How many of you like lima beans and Brussels sprouts and cauliflower? A few of you. I have to train myself to like that stuff. Sometimes it's that way with the Word of God because He knows what's... We, they sang a song about the Father loves us. There is no better Father because He knows what's best for us. And He knows that Brussels sprouts are good for us. Lima beans, I'm still unsure why He ever created them. <laughs> Lima beans? Yeah. Look at you two back there. Lima bean folks. But if I went to your house, I would eat them. Okay? If you made them for me, I would eat them. I just don't understand the presence. But we, in order for the Word of God to be alive, we have to take it in and chew it, savor it, let it digest into our heart and soul. It's an incredibly relevant thing in our life. The question always comes back to this. All, it says all scripture is inspired by God, etc., etc., etc. It always comes back to this question. And that is, will we allow God, will we seek Him purposefully to ask Him into our life? Or will the world, once we leave here, will, the world, will we let the world overwhelm us and press in so much on us that we get caught up in the myth of being too busy to receive His grace, to experience His grace, and then to be effectively a dispenser of grace to those who need to know what it's like. I'm going to ask you to go back just a little bit to 2 Timothy in chapter 2. I'm going to read and close with verses 24 through 26. Again, Paul's conduct was all about being a grace dispenser, sharing the sacred moments and the sacredness of God's grace with other people. Sometimes he did it in ways that probably blew people away. Other times he came upon them and overwhelmed them with his love. Verse 24 of, of the second, uh, second chapter says this, And the Lord's bondservant, that's you and I, you and I, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. People are saved by how well we love. God working through us. It is God's truth that goes out, and we read this in Isaiah 55, and it never comes back empty. It goes out and He does His work. It does His work because it's alive. But the second part of this is that, I read this earlier, or I mentioned this earlier, is that the good workman of God handles the Word of God, the Word of truth, with accuracy, with ad adequate accuracy. And I'm not talking about that we can, we can preach it letter by letter but that we can understand it enough to live it out and to love it well. So that when people come elbow to elbow with you, who come near you, are sensing something different in you, that you truly are a grace dispenser. Paul was a grace dispenser. Incredible grace dispenser. There were times in which he shook his feet and walked away, oftentimes away from the religious leadership. And we know from Jesus' life that the only people that he ever got angry with in which grace wasn't shown was to religious leadership. To those who need it. A world that hurts. A world that needs to know that they're loved by a God who created everything and a God who wants the relationship with them, who wants healing, that we have the ability to impact one another by how well we love, by how well the word that lives up here is alive in our heart and we can reach out to love others well. We're not quarrelsome. We find kindness, tenderheartedness. It's hard to think about that with what's going on in the world, isn't it? To be gentle with those who are in opposition. That's a challenge that only the Holy Spirit can help us with. Paul's life, and we've got about probably two weeks left before we're done with Paul's life. Paul's life is an incredible life of power, strength, humility, wisdom, knowledge, and the Holy Spirit actively alive to demonstrate who God is to him. 
is our example, as he said in here, look at my conduct. Look at my conduct. Again, I want to thank Kathy, you and your group for being here today, um, for, for helping us fill in a, a, a space, uh, and you led us so well. I thank you for your graciousness today, which you allowed God to dispense through you all to us, and I appreciate that a ton. Today, as you go out and about your day, you're going to turn on the news, you're going to see stuff, and you're going to be tempted to go, oh! Because every week we come up with another episode of terrorism, another episode of death. Every week, for the last supper of the wall, something else has happened. Now we've got 80-some people over in Paris, in France, run over. How many, how many more might die as a result of that? What's going to happen this next week? We must be prepared to respond in kind like Paul is telling us, with truth, with grace, with tenderness, and gentleness. That goes against the grain of our flesh. It goes against the grain of our flesh. The old stupid jock in me would love sometimes to do nothing more than grabbing a baseball and throwing it at somebody's head. I'd love to do that sometimes. And it's inside me, I'm going to go, no, that's not what I'm called to do. I'm not called to do that. To pray for. This week, how many of you prayed for leadership? How many of you prayed for, for the election that's coming up? Rest assured that God is in control. When you look at these two candidates, you can, out of all the millions of people who live in this country, are you kidding me? Pray for them, but realize that God is in control and not a thing goes on without his approval, without his ongoing approval. Chris said this to me last week, and it was really good. Uh, and that, because there are a lot of people that say, you know, golly, the United States is just falling, falling apart. It's just crumbling underneath us, you know? And she said, you know what? A, a, lady, a friend of hers that was in prayer with her said this, and it wasn't so much that we're falling apart, it's that the United States is falling into place for God. Only God knows what's around the corner. And are we falling into place in which we're going to be on our knees as a nation or not? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you give us the opportunity to open up your word freely here in this country still. And I pray, Father, for the future in which we trust you and what you're doing. And that, God, we might be great dispensers of your grace. And in order to do that, Father, we have to experience your grace, to taste it. Father, I pray for everybody here, including myself and my family, that this week, today, tomorrow, that God, we would purposely seek your presence. It could be while we're driving and listening to worship. It could be while we're driving and we're just praying. It could be while we're driving and somebody cuts us off in front of us and our flesh rears up and we say, no, God help me at this moment. It could be dealing with a difficult child, a difficult parent. It could be a moment in which we are wronged by somebody at work. But God, I pray that as we experience your grace, that we purposely pursue your word, your presence, so that others would be able to see, taste, and smell the grace of your loving presence in our life. Father, again, thank you for Kathy and the group of New Bridges that they came and they blessed us today. May you bless them, strengthen them as they continue to uh, one today, be away from their church family, which is hard. But God, that you would bless them as they go about their day as well. And be a blessing to everybody else here today. As we draw near to you, you draw near to us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. One of the my pet peeves, I guess, is a bumper sticker that says, God bless America. Yeah, I absolutely concur with that. But I'd rather see the bumper sticker, may we bless God. Let your life be a blessing out of God this week and be a good grace this country. God bless you again. Thanks, you guys, very much. Have a great day today. Thank you. Thank you. you can all leave now. So okay. Get up and say hi to one another.